Hi, everybody. I'm just a few seconds early um, today, but I'm Jacqueline Novogratz, and um, I am here today and every weekday until May 26th um, to read expert excerpts from my new book, um, Manifesto for a Moral Revolution. And uh, I wrote this book because, oof, like most of us, I see that our current institutions largely have run their course, and yet we've not imagined what we need to replace them. I was very specific in choosing words like moral, not to mean some set of rules prescribed from above, um, but what rather a framework that is renewed, that recognizes that in our interdependent world, there are many different cultures and truths that we hold that must be navigated. But in the center, the one immutable has to be our sense of human dignity, not just for this, but for many generations. It means a new way of doing things. It means a new skill set. It means moving from a focus on I to us, all of us. And, um, and so every day I'm focused on a different principle. Um, the book just came out, and if you buy this book, we also have a master course called um, The Path to Moral Leadership uh, at Acumen Academy slash Moral Revolution. Today I'm going to read a chapter called Partner with Humility and Audacity. It builds on yesterday's conversation about markets and how important it is to you learn to use markets and not be seduced by them. One of the things that we're seeing with COVID and this current crisis is an acceleration of many trends that were already in play. One of those trends, um, that we've been talking about, all of us interested in change, is a systems approach to change. This recognition that no single sector is going to solve our problems. Um, and so a critical skill set is that we learn to partner, sometimes with groups that we see as our adversary, whether we're in private sector, partnering with government or civil society, um, it takes the audacity to get ourselves on the same page and the humility to come forward with a sense of vulnerability, recognizing what we bring to the table, what's important to us for being at the table, and where we might fall short without the help of others. So as I read this passage over the next 15 minutes, um, if you have questions, put them into chat. And any time we have left at the end, I will do my best to answer. Partner with humility and audacity. To create change, we have to be willing to be uncomfortable without losing sight of what is important. Partnering effectively takes time and commitment. If we believe that a moral revolution requires everyone we must become skilled at building trusting partnerships across sectors. Honing this skill almost always requires a shift in both assumptions and behaviors. Nonprofits need to let go of suspicions that all corporations are greedy, exploitative, and unconcerned with the earth, while still holding to account those who are greedy and exploitative. For-profit companies must drop the assumption that all nonprofits are full of woolly-headed, morally righteous do-gooders who get nothing done while still calling to the carpet those who are ineffectual. And many of us must shift our lazy assumptions about other sectors, giving up presumptions about government as corrupt and ineffective, media, liars, philanthropy, entitled and disconnected, and technology, monstrous and self-serving. Of course, some people and organizations do fit those assumptions. But when we refuse to see the humanity in those who share a desire to create change, 
we miss the chance to amplify our work and realize our mission. And we are all needed to build more just and inclusive societies in which each individual counts. Yasmina Zaidman, Acumen's Chief of Strategic Partnership, wisely counsels, if I could have one wish, and this is something I try to practice myself, she says, it would be to enter a new partnership with greater openness to what the other side can offer and a courageous vulnerability to sharing fears and with the patience to take the time it needs to build trust. In other words, commit to the commitment itself. Sometimes what looks like a great partnership at first might ultimately let you down. My heart has been broken by corporations that told a good story of purpose, but in the end were focused on business as usual. One phrase I dread is we want to be part of radical change as long as it doesn't impact shareholder value. That is a clear moment for pushback or for a difficult conversation at the very least. It is a chance to try to bring your would-be partner's focus back to the problem you're trying to solve together. If you cannot do that, you may need another partner. If, however, you find a corporate partner that recognizes that its global supply chain is broken and wants to support models to make it more inclusive and sustainable, try to support that partner as it fights its internal battles. As with government, some of the most courageous change agents I have met with I have met work in large corporations. They are aware of the risks involved in rejecting the status quo, but they do so anyway. For them, partnering with external allies staves off the solitude that comes from being a lone questioning voice and also helps them bolster the firm's legitimacy in delivering on its promises to stakeholders. Some partnerships fail. It's a part of life. If a partnership sounds too good to be true, it usually is. If donors insist you collaborate with another organization, spend time making sure that the misalignment truly exists. No, sorry. If donors insist that you collaborate with another organization whose mission or values do not seem aligned, spend time making sure that the misalignment truly exists and then say no gracefully. Be wildly cautious when an organization calls and says, we love what you do. We should find ways to partner. If they cannot articulate why to partner, how to partner, or most important, to what end, you won't have a partnership. You'll have a mess. Ironically, sometimes those you see as least like you may be exactly who you need for what you want to accomplish. So start again with your mission and an understanding of which skills, markets, and communication outlets enable you to realize the good you are creating for those most in need. What if you're starting out with, a, with just a giant, uplifting, and daring idea and no resources, networks, or money? How do you even begin to find the partners who can help you realize your goal? There are a few better stories in my experience of impact investing than the one about a chicken company in Ethiopia that started out as a ragtag operation with founders who'd never seen live chickens, yet went on to change the fortunes of millions of poor farmers. Today, they are providing financial opportunities, improving health outcomes, transforming an industry, and in doing, helping to strengthen a nation. That story begins in 2009 when an American named Dave Ellis spent a year in Uganda working for a well-intentioned NGO in Uganda that never got off the ground. Some of the Ugandans he met wanted jobs, which convinced him that poverty would not be solved by an act of charity. The next year, encouraged to try something different, Dave and his partner, Joe Shields, traveled to Ethiopia, a country of 100 million people, with a small amount of investment capital in search of a business that would enable them to make a greater difference. Soon after arriving in Tigray, a region in northern Ethiopia near the border of Eritrea, Dave chanced upon the right opportunity. The government owned a 600,000 square foot defunct chicken operation and was looking for a partner to make it productive. The only problem 
was that it contained not a single healthy flock of chickens. Under past management, most of the chickens had died. Though David grown up in Chicago and had never encountered a live chicken, he was undaunted. The lease for the factory was within his financial reach and the opportunity he saw was enormous. In the region of Tigre, an estimated 50% of children were malnourished. Eggs are an inexpensive form of protein and chickens generate income. Moreover, a new generation of Ethiopian leaders was looking to partner with private sector players to jumpstart a flagging economy. Unlike the co-founders of Zikitsa, the ambulance company that initially was private, Dave, Joe, and a third co-founder, Trent Kutsubos, put their company into partnership with government from the start. They assumed that all they had to do was raise baby chicks to egg laying age, which is about 45 to 60 days, and then sell them to government extension agents who would be responsible for selling the chicks to smallholder farmers across the country. To fledgling entrepreneurs, Dave and Joe, this plan sounded straightforward and easy. The first night the entrepreneurs were on the farm with newly purchased chickens, two of the chicken houses caught on fire from an electrical malfunction, and the founders had to carry the frightened birds outside in their arms. Once things settled down, the company restarted operations and set a date with government extension workers to pick up a major order of baby chicks exactly 35 days after they were born. The workers showed up with 15 trucks a month late. By then, the company founders had already scrabbled to sell the baby chicks to whomever they could find. This was another setback to operations, resulting in more lost money that the founders didn't have. As for the extension workers, they had no choice but to return to their posts with empty trucks. Trust on both sides plummeted. Dented, but undaunted, Dave and Joe went back to the drawing board. The co-founders reviewed that, reviewed what had happened and reminded themselves of their purpose. They were in Ethiopia to build a successful chicken operation that would feed the poor and change the lives of poor farmers. They reconsidered their own strengths and weaknesses as well as those of other various partners. Try, fail, learn, start again. This time, Dave and Joe tried selling one-day-old chicks directly to the farmers, but the farmers were both poor and overworked, earning on average $350 a year. Smallholders can afford to buy just a few tick chickens at a time, and they have multiple constraints that prevent them from finding the right vaccines, the most effective feed, and the means to keep the chickens safe at night when predators such as foxes and dogs roam about looking for vulnerable, fluffy, chirping yellow snacks. In short, raising baby chicks from birth to 45 days, after which time they could thrive in a village environment, took time, money, and expertise, none of which the smallholders had. Though operations faltered again, Dave and Joe were gaining a better sense of the farmers and the government's potential as partners. While Ethiopia's state-run enterprises may have lacked some efficiencies, the government's agricultural extension workers who knew and lived among smallholder farmers were highly trusted. The government workers thus represented an enormous asset to the company. If Dave and Joe were willing to discern those functions where government workers were most capable of delivering. Dave explained, we saw that we could work with local government offices to mobilize demand for chickens and educate the farmers. The government also helped us reach last mile areas. We could never reach ourselves. So the co-founders changed the model again. The company, which Dave and Joe named Ethio Chicken, now breeds chickens and incubates eggs, selling them a day after they're born in batches of 1,000 to agents, individual entrepreneurs who raise the chicks for the next 45 to 60 days. Ethio Chicken provides the agents with the vaccine, 
feeds, and other supplies along with the inputs and advice they require to succeed. Then the agents help the farmers by selling three to four chickens at a time in collaboration with government extension workers. Once the chickens are at egg laying age, they stay close to home and eat most anything, making them the perfect investment for a small farmer. In August 2017, Dave and I met Johannes, a 19-year-old who had signed up to serve as an agent, raising the tiny chicks until they'd grown old enough to sell to individual farmers. We stood together in the corrugated tin shed Johannes had constructed to house 2,000 chicks, wearing wraparound sunglasses, a black watch, a white lab coat, and an amulet around his neck. Johannes waved his delicate, long-fingered hands enthusiastically as he shared with me his success. A couple of years prior, he'd taken a loan from a local microfinance organization to purchase his first batch of a thousand chicks. I knew that I had to keep those chicks healthy and alive, he said. I slept in the room with them every night. Ethio Chicken gave me advice and the government helped me until I could sell all the chickens. Now I am a happy man. All my brothers and sisters go to school and they are happy too. We'd been speaking for a good half hour before Johannes shared that he'd taken a risk with the company because his life depended on it. He and his five younger siblings had been orphaned and the teenage Johannes was responsible for their collective welfare. His risk and diligence paid off. By the end of 2017, he had sold 15,000 chickens, all to smallholder farmers. That year, his earnings exceeded $10,000 an astronomical sum in a country where most people earn a dollar a day. In 2019, Ethio Chicken sold over 1.5 million one-day-old chicks every month to 5,500 agents who earn anywhere from $1,000 to $10,000 a year. The agents sell to about 4 million farmers who represent nearly 25 million family members. By our estimates, Ethio Chicken is annually injecting more than $200 million into Ethiopia's economy. The company has grown to 1,200 employees, all but four of them Ethiopian. In the 5 million person region of Tigray, where Ethiopia Chicken started, where Ethio Chicken started, malnutrition rates have fallen more than 11%. The government credits Ethio Chicken with much of that gain in nutrition, and it has integrated chicken rearing into its over agricultural strategy. Ethio Chicken learned to partner with the government, with agents, with Acumen as an investor, and with charities such as the Gates Foundation. Each of these partners brought something different to this enterprise while remaining committed to the same goal. Getting Ethio Chicken on its feet may have taken longer than either Dave or Joe thought it would when they started, but by partnering with government, the company helped make Ethiopia a model for empowering smallholder farmers with chickens and their eggs as a source of both income and protein. What struck me most about Dave and Dave's and Ethio Chicken's approach to partnering was again, not only the audacity of their vision, but the quality of their humility and therefore their ability to build trust. Dave speaks openly about the mistakes the company made when he and Joe first arrived at Ethiopia. He recognizes that they initially assumed they had the answers, rushing to share what they themselves were bringing to the table. They first had to listen more closely to what the government needed in order to help its people and only then act. Dave and Joe also realized that they could not partner alone effectively. They needed the assistance of people, such as Dr. Shveha Teshvu, their soft-spoken but resilient Ethiopian national sales manager who manages Ethio Chicken's relationship with government. On the government side, the state minister for live, livestock, Dr. Jebrazi Jebra Johannes, was a believer in the company's potential from its early days, backing them up as they hit inevitable speed bumps along the path to success. After all, individuals not institutions create the relationships that lead to change. 
Dave models building trust with those at, at all levels of an institution and all kinds of stakeholders. I have watched him interact with agents, farmers, and extension workers with enormous humility, shaking everyone's hand, speaking in Ethiopia's official tongue, Amharic, eating the local food with the exuberance he brings to everything, and praising the goodness he has discovered in his adopted country. In never forgetting that you are a guest, you are more likely to be accepted as a local. In 2014, recognizing the company's ability to deliver, Ethiopia's southern nations, nationalities, and people's region offered Ethio Chicken a contract to take over two more failing farms, this time on a fixed payment arrangement. I don't think we would have been as successful without working with the Ethiopian government, Dave told me. The government allowed us to build trust very quickly with smallholder farmers and to build a market that has changed the game. I was recently asked if it was possible to teach people to build trust. Yes, I believe so. Given that trust is our rarest currency, we have no choice but to teach our children and one another to be trusting and worthy of trust. You build trust by showing up, by listening to some, what someone else has to say, by keeping promises. You build trust through shared endeavor and by the consistency of your words and actions. You build it by admitting mistakes and by committing, communicating both when things go well and when they fail. You build trust by knowing your values, living them, and being clear with others that you will not violate those values. Most of our grandmothers could have given us the same advice. So partner with humility and audacity. I talk about building the big, it's also to build in our communities, in our nations. We are not going to solve the problems that we see around us today, particularly given the need to integrate the vulnerable if we don't learn how to partner across sectors and importantly across lines of difference. So partner with humility and audacity. Um, I love that Steve Ross had some chickens. So millions is almost un unimaginable. Yes, audacious. Um, wow, thanks Juliet. How can we rebuild trust in corporations and government so that we can partner with them. You know, again, I think that um, building trust requires a vulnerability in yourself um, to extend yourself as a bridge and to not approach the other side um, with all of the assumptions that you hold of where they may fall short, but rather to assume goodness. Um, to start with your own vulnerability. Some of the most effective partnerships that we have made at Acumen have also been our most challenging, quite frankly, um, where we have to recognize what we, what we want from the relationship um, as well as what we're willing to give. The hardest part is when it doesn't go right to find the courage and frankly, the vocabulary to talk about um, what went wrong and how you make it better. Um, and again, I'm seeing in this moment of great acceleration, huge opportunity to help each other. One of the partner, one of the Acumen fellows that I'm really proud of um, in this moment of COVID crisis is a guy named um, Abdal from uh, Pakistan. So when he was in the fellowship, I hope I'm not uh, embarrassing him, but when he was in the fellowship uh, and talking about where government might sometimes fall short, his fellow fellows said, you know, put your money where your mouth is and go work with government. And so he did. And he became advisor um, to the Ministry of Education in Punjab, which is a, a big um, education system, about 11 or 12 million, um, 12 million public school students and then there's another six to seven million students that 
are out of the education system altogether. And then, and I talked about this yesterday, there's another 11 or 12 million students that are in the private sector where low-income parents just want some better form of education when, they, when, what, when there are no public schools particularly for their kids to go to. So they'll pay a very little amount of money and they often get low quality, but it's better than nothing. So imagine suddenly the country's in lockdown. All the schools are closed. Abdel now is tasked with the unenviable but incredibly audacious job of finding a way to get education to the 12 million public school students first who now don't have school to go to. And in the province of Punjab, which is what I'm talking about, the internet access rates are about 31%. Most people don't have smartphones. And, um, and so you got a problem. But crisis is also an opportunity to transform. He moved quickly. He and others created a coalition of government partners, private sector partners like cable television companies and, um, and cell phone companies. Um, he worked with other Acumen fellows, both in the private sector and in civil society who were working in ed tech and are, were, were content creators. And together this coalition, by assuming goodness and showing what they were good at and where they needed help, were able to build a cable television um, station that provided educational opportunities because uh, most people had access to television. Smartphone app for those who did have um, the ability to download an app and, um, and radio content so that people who had neither television nor Wi-Fi access could access educational content on the radio. And not only are they seeing significant utilization of this kind of educational content within the 12 million um, public school student, but, but many young people who've been outside the educational system altogether are also accessing it. Um, that's a real example of building trust by starting with What's the problem that you want to solve? Why are you at the table? Can you respect what the other one brings? And also recognize where the other one needs your help and vice versa. And as I said before, some of the best partnerships end up being between those you might consider your adversary at first. But when you recognize you have the same goal and you have the vulnerability and the courage to talk about what you're good at and where you need help, anything is possible. Yesterday, you mentioned the risk of making money off the backs of the poor. Tell us how you screen entrepreneurs for values and humility to ensure alignment. Thanks, Steve Ross, for that question. Um, first, I have to start with some humility. Um, we've gotten a lot better at understanding alignment because we made some mistakes. I think sometimes, and I would say especially when we're young and we want to, you know, we want to gain success based on more traditional outcomes. We look more at the numbers, spreadsheets, spreadsheets, the idea that an entrepreneur is bringing us rather than spending the kind of ample time that's, rec that's required to really look into someone's character. Um, especially in the early days with Acumen, we're patient capital, we're focused on long-term investments that focus on um, including the poor. A few entrepreneurs thought patient capital is easy, easy capital. And so they said they would, um, they would focus on the poor, at least eventually. Uh, but it was very clear in early days that when the going got tough, um, the first people that they would exclude were low-income people. So now we spend much more time looking at values alignment. Um, having values conversations, understanding their background, even the way that people answer questions around when they failed. Do they have the humility to actually tell you the truth and importantly, what they've learned from it? Are there people within the community that can vouch for what it has been like to partner with and or um, work with these individuals? I think it's really important that when we look at entrepreneurs, 
that they have the self-awareness to know that most entrepreneurs may have the vision and the ability to catalyze change, they aren't always the best managers. And so are they surrounding themselves with people who um, are strong where they might be weak? And so it's this alchemy, if you will, that insists on looking at the character of an entrepreneur and not just the content that she brings um, to sell what she's doing that becomes most important. Because remember, these are sometimes 10 to 12 year ventures to make change at the scale that an Ethiopia, Ethio chicken made. And so you're marrying this entrepreneur. You better understand what drives them, how they operate, their level of integrity, um, their ability to have resiliency and grit. So partner with, um, with that audacity to know that together we can solve all of our problems and the humility to recognize that it is hard. And if you do not have a partner on the other side that you can trust and that you can tell the truth to, we will not solve our problems. Sometimes I say that small is beautiful and scale is critical if we are going to solve our toughest problems. And we will not reach that scale, not in a way that includes the vulnerable and not in a way that builds environmental sustainability if we don't learn to partner better. So thank you again um, for being part of today and um, listening to this excerpt. Um, don't forget that if you do buy the book before May 26, um, you will get access to the course at Acumen Academy slash Moral Revolution for free and it normally costs uh, $200 and I hope you will join. Um, so good luck and have a great day, everybody.